glad to see Diane and Joyce walk in <laughs> with their bright shirts. It's like, okay, I'm not totally out of place. But it's so good to see everybody this morning. Um, so good to see your smiling faces. Um, we serve a tremendous God, a God who is amazing in so many ways. And I'm going to invite you to stand up, and we're going to sing about our God and worship him. commands all the hosts of heaven who else could make every king bow down who else can whisper and darkness trembles only a holy God what other beauty demands such splendor outshines the sun. What other majesty rules with justice? Only a holy God. Come and behold him, the one and the only. Cry out, sing holy. power can raise the dead. What other name remains undefeated? Hold me a holy rescue me from my failure who else would offer his only son who else invites me to call him father only a holy God only my holy Word. 
worship the Holy God. Come. pray with me. Father, we do thank you for this beautiful morning you have given to us to gather together. Thank you for the the people that you have put in our lives that we can worship together with, that we can fellowship. Uh, we thank you that we are uh, called to come and worship you, that we can come into your presence, and know you, and to see your beauty. Uh, this morning, Father, there are many who are perhaps jumping with joy. There are many who are, are suffering, who maybe aren't able to be with us this morning. Um, we think of, of Deb Picarell, especially amongst, amongst many others. Um, Father, would you use this time, um, whether we are here, whether we are at home or um, away, uh, work in our hearts. Uh, help us to see your, your beauty, your, uh, your holiness, a little bit more and, and make us more into your image. We thank you for wanting to use us and loving us. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. This finally does feel like a fall day. This last week, um, it, it felt very, very summery, and it was, it was wonderful to be out. But we finally, we've got the, the rain, the cloudiness. Um, hopefully you will enjoy it. I have one main announcement to get through and then two maybe bigger ones and then I will get out of the way and Missy Iverson will come up and finish our whole production here. So first, um, November 19th is our Beast Feast. We do not have a slide for it. Um, it's a wonderful time gathering together food and, and laughter. Um, I believe there is a sign-up sheet downstairs, but um, more details will be to follow. So November 19th, that's the week before Thanksgiving, the Beast Feast. Everyone is welcome. Come join us for a wonderful time. All right. So I have two announcements after that. And I've never done anything like this. The first one is that my dear wife is expecting something. <laughs> We're not sure what that is, but we will, we will let you know in a few months. And the second is our, uh, our couple back here in front of the sound booth, Kyle and Jessica, have taken a step in their relationship together, and they are now engaged. So, of course, what everybody wants you to do is go mob the people and ask them all the questions afterward. All right, that is everything I have. Missy, will you come up? is coming. <laughs> I'm so excited. So I don't know if y'all listen to the Toby Mac song, but that's what we listen on the way to church today. Can't wait for Christmas. Um, so anyways, yes, we are having a Christmas party for children. Um, it's a, it's going to be December 2nd. It's a day for parents or grandparents to drop their children off here from 1 to 3.30. Um, infants to 6th grade. Um, and if you don't have children, steal some. No, don't steal some. But bring some. Bring your neighbors. We can have an awesome program. I hear they're bringing in the CEF director to teach a Bible lesson. It's going to be great, right? You all didn't get that. <laughs> but it's okay. I'm the CEF director. No. So um, anyhow, um, we're excited about it. Um, bring, but we can have a great program, but if there's no children here, we want to reach some unsaved, unchurched children. We're sending the flyer home with every kid at school, 
Yay, our school does that. I love that. Um, so we'll, if you would like to volunteer, you can see um, Patty Spade or myself, but if I don't write it down, I don't remember it. Um, Pre-registration. Um, there's forms down by the offering box, right? Um, so we'd like to know how many kids to expect on Saturday. Um, but yes, so bring and invite your grandchildren, your neighborhood children, um, just so that we can get the gospel out to them. At Christmas time, people are so much more open to hearing the gospel message, and we just thought it'd be a great way. To, people can drop the kids, go shopping, come back. We're going to have a half an hour at the end where the parent, when the parents pick their kids up to meet and greet them and eat some cookies and some stuff. So, um, yay! Christmas is coming! <laughs> So many exciting announcements. <laughs> I feel like I need to do the, my next thing with joy and anticipation. <laughs> and I probably will. <laughs> there are so many needs that we have when we look around our congregation, when we look around our world and all the things that are going on. And if it wasn't for the God of grace, you would probably go boom wipe us all out but he doesn't because he is full of grace and mercy amen, amen. i'm going to have you stand up this morning and we're going to sing about our god of grace and mercy therefore since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens jesus the son of god let us hold fast our confession for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So good that we can come to him, that throne of grace. sing. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. My rock. 
darkness overwhelms and my fears are pressing in I will trust in you O Lord in the silence I will wait I will stand upon your word you're my solid rock and my salvation my steadfast Precious Heavenly Father, our God, our Master, our Lord, our strong defender, our solid rock, our salvation, our security, 
our one defense, our hope, the lover of our soul, the one true living, holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, absolutely pure and righteous and just, perfect, no sin, no evil, completely set apart from that all-powerful, everywhere present, all-wise, perfect in your love, your grace, your mercy. You are truth. You are eternal. You are self-existent. We declare, not just with our, our lips, our, our voices, and our minds, but with our hearts, in our heart of hearts, there is none like you. And we've gathered to worship you, to reflect on your glory, all you are, because that reveals to us all that you do. We've gathered to praise you, to honor you, to acknowledge you, to bow before you and thank you, to declare our love for you and our desire to want what you want. So, Father, we ask that you would use this time together as we've gathered together with brothers and sisters in Christ, that you would use this time to, to challenge us and to, to convict us, to teach us, that you'd use this time to encourage and comfort us, that you'd use this time to warn us, that you'd use this time to build us up as your children and, and connect us even deeper in the love of Christ with one another so that we want to, to not only love you, but out of that love to obey, to walk in ways that bring you glory, honor, and praise, to make decisions that, that count for eternity that are not based on just the here and now. We, we want our goals and our priorities to line up with the the, the priorities that you give us in your word. We want to be your ambassadors as we represent you at school and at, at work, uh, in our families, with our friends, in our neighborhoods and communities. And Father, we thank you for this time to build us up and to encourage us, time to reflect on you and worship you as we lift our voices and our hearts and in praise through singing and prayer and adoration and, and to confess our, our need for you, our, our dependence upon you. And to ask you to have your will and your way in our lives, to, to come together and to, to study your word together as you've seen fit to reveal yourself to us. And we praise you for that. We thank you for that. And Father, your word makes it clear as well that every one of us need a, a savior. And the, the only one that, that can save us from sin, past, present, and future, is Jesus the Christ, the, the, third, the second person of the Godhead who, who willingly took our place, bore the condemnation that our, our sins not only deserve, but that a righteous, holy God demands. And Jesus willingly bore that condemnation in our place as a sinless, spotless lamb. And three days later, rose again triumphant, conquering sin and death, eternal separation. And just as he, he told his followers in that night in which he was betrayed, we believe what he told them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. We thank you this morning, Jesus for your sacrifice and your resurrection in our place. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, for your ministry of conviction, drawing us to a Savior, showing us our need, because we've all sinned. We've, we've fallen short of your glory. We've, we've walked independent of you in our own pride and our self-sufficiency. And we need redemption. And we thank you, Jesus, for dying and rising again and Holy Spirit, for showing us the one and only true and living Savior. And we thank you for that wonderful gift of grace. That when we admit that we're sinners and deserve that 
that condemnation. We can believe in our heart that, that Jesus, you died for our sins and rose again, and we can call out to you and confess that you're our Lord to come into our lives and, and rescue us, to, to save us, to deliver us. And we thank you so much for that glorious gift of eternal life through faith in Christ. And we ask this morning, Holy Spirit, if if there's anyone here that doesn't know you as a Savior and Lord, they've never trusted Jesus for forgiveness of sin and new life in Christ, that today might be their day of salvation, that you would open their hearts to respond to the good news of the gospel. And Father, for those of us that do know you, we pray, Lord, that that our hearts would be open and responsive to your word and that you'd continue to transform us into the image of our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. And that we'd be willing to experience whatever you choose to use, the good times and the difficult times, to make us more like Jesus. Father, we do pray for those in our number that are experiencing tremendous difficulty with with disease and sickness, with with broken relationships, with financial challenges, with with, with all the things that we experience here on earth. Lord, we bring them before you and ask for your, your grace to be absolutely sufficient in their time of need and that through the times of of darkness and difficulty, of loss and and suffering and hurt and pain, that they would see you clearly holding on to them with a loyal love that will never let go and that you would use this time for your glory and their good. We pray as brothers and sisters, we would rally around them and encourage them and, and, and help them and serve them in any way that we can. And Lord, we pray that we would truly trust you in all of our needs. We pray for our world and the challenges, the wars and the the difficulties going on, and we commit them to you. We pray for our nation, Lord, and, and its leadership. We pray that you would work in those areas for your glory and our good. And we pray for revival, Father amongst your people, that that we would be revived in our walk with you and walk closer and band together for your glory with one another. And we pray for rebirth and regeneration of the lost. And we pray that it all result in glory, honor, and praise. Thank you for this time to gather and worship and focus on your word. Holy Spirit, we invite you to have free course in our lives. May we respond with faith and obedience because of your great love now as you draw us to Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen. What a blessing to to be able to gather together and read God's word, to to pray, to sing these songs of, of truth that... that that remind us of who our God is and to lift our voices in praise as we do that and um, just the blessing to to gather together with brothers and sisters in Christ and share things that God is doing in our lives. And Nate has shared a few of those things. I want to call your attention to just a few more. We do congratulate Nate and Kennedy, excited for them and And one of the things that he didn't mention that many of you also know that in the last few weeks, Kate and Kate and Nenity, Nate and Kennedy have also purchased a home and um, we're excited for them. Many of uh, of you have been involved helping them move in and, and relocate to this new home. And we'd also like to give that opportunity to everyone. Um, and that is through a, um, a, a pantry shower that we'd like to, to have for Nate and Kennedy. And that is when we just bring all sorts of, of, of good things, not just the leftover lima beans that nobody's eaten, you know, for months. Um, do you guys like lima beans? Eh, don't bring in lima beans. Um, but my point is bring stuff that, that will last, that can go into their pantry, and let's just fill that pantry with bunches of good um, stuff for them to take care of them as a tangible way to express our love to them. There will be a place downstairs to bring that. It, it'll be finished by the 12th, not next Sunday, which is the 5th, but on November 12th. There will be that place there. Bring your stuff there, and let's just flood that table and our love for these guys as we 
share that with them and um, what a blessing that is. And so let's make sure that we take part in that and um, look forward to that on November 12th. Um, there's also um, a box downstairs for Abigail Hall. Um, many of you have been involved. Um, we've had the opportunity to demonstrate some good cheer um, in the Hall's life, um, especially for Abigail as she's broken her leg and things, and you've been bringing things, contributing. That's downstairs on the table, and Abby, you can take that home with you today. And we're just excited about what God's doing through challenging times in, in your life, and we want to reach out in a tangible way. So that's downstairs. Please take that. Um, and we want to continue to be praying for her healing as well. Um, I have two other things. Nate mentioned a beast feast coming up, and you don't want to miss that. That's that Sunday before Thanksgiving on the, on the 19th of November this year. We'll get back together at 6 p.m. downstairs in the fellowship hall. He mentioned there's a sign-up sheet downstairs. And not only do we not know who's coming, but you're bringing the food. We just don't want you all to bring desserts made out of squirrel and possum and stuff, you know? You, you can bring some desserts as a place place to sign up to say I'm bringing desserts, there's a place to sign up I'm bringing side dish, and there's a place to bring main dish. So sign up on the column downstairs, let us know you're coming, and which of those, if you want to bring all three, that's fine, just let us know so that we don't just get together on Thanksgiving and, and eat cake and pie, which would be wonderful, but it wouldn't really be a beast feast, okay? Um, and that does not mean it has to all be wild game. If you want to bag your turkey down at Reynoldson's uh, and bring that, that's fine. Um, there will be some wild game, but there will be other stuff for those people who don't enjoy that kind, and especially if you bring it, right? But it's a great time to, to gather as brothers and sisters in Christ and to thank God for his faithfulness, to do that over a feast together downstairs, and then we transition into a time of thanksgiving. So I tell you in, in advance so you come prepared to share a testimony, a praise to God to thank him for his faithfulness. And we'll sing some, we'll read some scripture that night, and, and we'll focus mainly on sharing our thanksgiving to God. You don't want to miss it. It's coming up on the 19th, 6 p.m. You hunters, plenty of time to get back, get in, and get here, okay? Okay the 6 p.m. on Sunday, November 19th. Immediately following the service that morning, though, on the 19th, we will be having our fall business meeting here at the church where we approve the budget for the following year. Our, our annual meeting always takes place in March, but by then we've already three months into it. So last year we began the process of meeting in November to approve to approve the budget, you'll have a, a report out for a couple of weeks before to be reviewing that, as well as to elect our, our ministry leaders in those positions. The nominating committee will be meeting and have that slate of officers and ministry leaders, and we'll be voting on those. It'll be a short meeting right after the morning service, um, and then we'll be dismissed to have some coffee and things and head on into Sunday school. That's the 19th. Lots of things going on. There's a Christmas party coming up the first Saturday in, in, in December. Invite those kids. Get them here. Let's fill this place. There's going to be games. There's going to be crafts. There's going to be a Bible story. The true message of Christmas. Cookies. Opportunities with parents. It's going to be a mini VBS on one Saturday morning. And let's make the most of it. Um, there are so many other things coming up. Invite your friends to the Beast Feast. Wouldn't that be a great time to invite unchurched people and let them see how thankful we are to God for what he's been doing all year and what a positive testimony and a, a free meal as well and just a wonderful time. These build on each other and, uh, you know, there's a, a ladies' banquet coming up the next weekend and, and then the following weekend will be our what we call our Christmas Sunday where you're encouraged to invite all sorts of friends and family members to worship with us that, that, that week before Christmas. 
um, Christmas falls on a Monday this year, so this will be not the 24th, but the 17th, where we'll be doing, using, there won't be any Sunday school that day. Afterwards, we'll have a, a time of fellowship with some delicious desserts. And once, just like Missy said, th this Christmas party for kids doesn't work if we don't have a bunch of kids. Our Christmas Sunday is designed to invite unchurched friends, family members, so that they'll hear the real message of Christmas. Just like she said, Christmas time opens many doors. And I share all these things for each of us to be excited, to be praying, to be planning, to be inviting, and to be looking forward with anticipation to what God's going to do through all of these things. It's hard to believe, but next Sunday, if Jesus doesn't come back first, which, that'd be okay too, wouldn't it? Wow, that'd be wonderful, right? Um, wow, exciting, that'd be great, but, but if he doesn't, next Sunday is November. Can you believe that? First Sunday, we'll be celebrating communion as we continue to look at Romans chapter 8. I just encourage you to have that anticipation, to, to be excited about what God has in store. And as we spend time in his word, I believe the Holy Spirit wants to use his word today to continue to stir and excite each of us as we focus on our relationship with God through faith in Christ. Open your Bibles with me, if you would, to Romans chapter 8. Last week, if you were here with us, I'd been gone for a couple weeks, and, and I do thank Nate for preaching for those couple of Sundays that I was gone. But, but I came back, and, and I was just kind of hot, it seemed. I just was studying, it, it just didn't want to. And so we, we did this um, overview of Romans chapter 8, and I challenged each of you through this week to maybe read Romans chapter 8, 1 through 39 every day this past week. And I'm going to encourage you to continue to do that. Add that to your devotional time. It's not going to take a lot of time unless it takes a lot of time because God is using it and you can't get away from it. And that, that's wonderful if God chooses to do it. But the, the choice to do it is not a huge commitment for hours. It's a few minutes to read those 39 verses, but to do it every day until we finally complete Romans chapter 8 for the time being, whatever that's going to look like, will help us all see in a clearer way the glories of so great a salvation we have through faith in Christ. And so I trust that you were reading through it some, and if you didn't, I'm not here to bully you and make you feel bad about it. Start it this thing. Read it today. Read it tomorrow. If you only read it a few times, that's better than none at all. But keep focusing on the blessings, the riches of Romans chapter 8. And I believe you'll come with that same excitement that I come on Sundays to see what does God have in store for us today. And in Romans chapter 8, we did the overview, and I shared, and you said, wait a minute, Mark, we've been in Romans 8 for months. Why was last week an overview? Maybe it was for me because I was gone two weeks, and I needed the overview. But it was helpful for me to see that big sweeping picture of where Paul is going, and I said we'd go back now and look at a few more of the parts for a few weeks, okay? So open your, in Romans chapter 8, look with me at verse 18, if you would. Romans chapter 8. And verse 18 starts like this. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time, the, the sufferings we experience during the, the time here on earth, during this present time, are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. What a powerful statement that Paul makes. And when he talks about the sufferings here, we've got to realize that in context, those details are given to us in the verses ahead. It says there in verse 16, the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit himself, who has indwelt every believer. Remember, he, he mentions the Spirit's ministry 18 or 19 times in this chapter alone. The ministry of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. 
And, and so he says, the Holy Spirit himself testifies with our spirit, not to our spirit, but with, in communion with the real me that is trusting Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, that has been redeemed, who is already seated in the heavenlies, but is still in this earth suit here, th this humanness here, until some future ultimate redemption and he's going to talk about that he's alluded to it back in chapter 7 when he talked about the struggle that he has that this tremendous apostle of jesus christ still struggled from time to time with his flesh with sin and he he isolates that because he says the real me is redeemed is brand new in christ is not only accepted but acceptable not because i earned it but because god gifted me his righteousness He's made me brand new in Christ, but I'm still housed in humanness, a body that is not fit for heaven. It's a body that ultimately will die if that happens before Jesus comes back. Do you, do you understand? That, that, that's what's going to happen. It's going to return to dust um, because this body has served its purpose here on earth. But that means there must be a future glorified body. And that's where the eager anticipation, the expectation comes. And that's why Paul said the, the, the humanness is where Satan and the world and the flesh can still attack me. But it's not the real me. That's the whole discussion of chapter 7. You turn the page to chapter 8, verse 1, and he says, There's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And he talks about that, that glorious salvation and all that God has done. And I, I look at that as a bookend on, on Romans 8. He starts with no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Why? Because Jesus already took my condemnation. That's what the first four verses say. What the law couldn't do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did. Sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And as an offering for sin, what did he do? He condemned sin in the flesh. The sinless, spotless lamb, Jesus, took my place, bore the condemnation for my sin as my substitute. And God accepted that in my place because he raised him from the dead three days later. That's the picture. And that's why Paul says, no condemnation, no judgment for those of us who have experienced God's amazing grace, and we all know through the first seven chapters, none of us earned it or deserved it. We receive that by faith. It's God's grace that we respond to, and we take him at his word and believe him. That's what faith is. It's not works of righteousness which we've done, but according to his mercy, he saves us. And so as we look at that, there's no condemnation at the first. The last few verses says there's no separation from his love. That's verses 35 through 39, bookends, right? And all the content in between just elaborates on the riches and the blessings that we have in Christ. Christ in me, the hope of glory. In 2023, I'm in him and he's in me and, and nothing can separate me from God's loyal love. Why? Because there's no condemnation because Jesus bore it all for me. And then he talks about the, the other components and details as he elaborates on this great salvation in Christ. And so if you look at where we were in verse 16, the Spirit himself testifies. That's one of the blessings to being in Christ. The third person of the Godhead takes up residence in me. He indwells me. He seals me. He's my pledge, that, that, that deposit guaranteeing future resurrection. He teaches, he guides, he convicts, he comforts the, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. That third person of the Godhead, we're going to get to a place in a week or two where we're going to see that he's even groaning and interceding for us. We're going to look at the groaning of the creation today and the groaning of God's people today. In a week or two, we'll look at the groaning of the Holy Spirit as he intercedes for us. And it's not just the Holy Spirit that's interceding for us. Look with me at verse, 20, at verse 34. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, rather was raised, who's at the right hand of God. 
In other words, if someone's going to condemn us, you can tell them, take it up with my Savior. He bore my condemnation for me, and God accepted it in my place. How do I know it? He raised him from the dead, and now he's seated at the right hand of the Father in all authority. Take that condemnation up with him, because there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So who condemns? Take that up with Jesus, is what Paul's saying. But what does he say at the end of the verse? That Christ Jesus is the one who also intercedes for us. He's interceding for us. The Holy Spirit's interceding for us. No condemnation, no separation from his love. Justification, God declares us righteous because we earned it? No, because we couldn't. But Jesus died for my sins, took the punishment, and gives me his righteousness. That's why God declares me righteous. Um, All of these parts of the salvation that he's going to elaborate on are, are so glorious. And as we're back there at verse 16, the Spirit himself is bearing witness with our spirit. What's it telling us? We are children of God. Folks, the security and the stability that Paul presents in Romans chapter 8, it it comes through our salvation because it's all by God's grace anyway. None of us earned it. We didn't do anything to deserve it. And he's making it clear we can't do anything to, to, to lose it. And the beauty of what he's going to discuss here in Romans 8, 9, 10, and 11 is that God's process of redeeming us began before he created the world so in some ways this process that he's going to be talking about though it takes place in everyday life for for you and me when we respond to the good news at at that point we are forgiven of sin and made brand new in christ in our living experience here on this earth um The real me has changed. That takes place. But the beauty as we read the scriptures is God was preparing this before he created the world. He's bringing it to pass in our lifetime. That is, if you respond to the good news. Do you understand? That that if you admit you need to be rescued and believe the only way is through Jesus who died and rose again for you. That begins the salvation experience in our lifetime continuum and in temporal creation of are you with me i'm I'm not i don't have the words to say it but i think you see what i'm saying began before he created happens in our lifetime and the beauty is through these passages of scripture he says it's absolutely eternally secure for all eternity going forward and that's the beauty of the salvation that god has given to us And he wants us to see it in full and living color. And so he says the Spirit's even testifying with our spirits. We're children of God. And if children, verse 17, heirs also of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. We don't like that prepositional phase. If we suffer with him that we'll also be glorified with him. And see, if we step back like we did last week and, and see it from 8.1 to, to 8.39 and this glorious picture that God has been working out in our lives, we know that even the sufferings that we experience because of our faith in our Savior cannot separate us from his love. They can, they can hurt us here on earth. They can say mean things about us. They can talk behind our back. They can exclude us. In some parts of our world, they can even take our jobs, separate us from families. They can even take our lives. Do you, do you understand that is happening around the world for those who are suffering with Christ? But, but the beauty of what Paul is saying, when you look at all that could happen, and anybody remember anything about the Apostle Paul's life when he was sharing God's word? Was it all hunky-dory? He was kind of on this protected highway where nothing could happen to him physically or, or relationally or nothing ever happened. No! Just look through the book of 1 and 2 Corinthians as he talks about Just read through the book of Acts and see how often he was persecuted how often he, he was distressed, he was hemmed in, how often he was beaten, how often... 
And yet he loved Jesus with his whole heart. The whole idea is the beauty, if you see this big picture, is God's not going to waste anything that he takes us through here on earth. It's all to bring us to his intended goal, which is conformity with our Savior, with Jesus Christ. And the reality is, as hard as it is for us to admit to it, most of us would have to agree that the difficult, challenging, stretching, confusing times of life show us how much we we need God. They, They knock off rough edges in our life. They change our focus. If I'm not careful, my focus through my flesh will be on me, myself, and I in here and now even as a child of the king. And God's telling me in his word, that's not like you, because you're just passing through. This is just temporary residence. I've got something so much greater for you. Focus your goals, your dreams, your priorities, the decisions you make based on eternity, your relationship with me. And yet if you're anything like me, the world does a pretty good job of pushing me into its mold so I kind of believe that security and satisfaction and fulfillment and meaning is wrapped up in the stuff that they're using to and that's only temporary it won't last and and so the beauty of what he's saying to us is suffering because of our there's a couple things you say but Mark I really don't suffer much for my faith and and I realize in comparison to 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 countries where they're losing their lives, that's an accurate statement. Would you not agree? But the reality is, if we as children of God are not experiencing at least a little ridicule, a a little exclusion, uh, some things being said about us, if we're not experiencing it at all, maybe they can't tell that we are. We've blended in so much like them that there's no... feeling a little bit hot now maybe under the seat a little in the heart is where we should feel it maybe my values my decisions my priorities aren't focused where god wants them to be and so please don't take that and say okay the preacher railed on me for having anything and man i drive a new car there must be something wrong with it i've got a nice place to live i've got enough that's not what we're saying Those are all good things that God provides for us. The question is, how do I view them? If they bring me security, if that's what I need to feel stable and financially secure, if this is what I need to keep up with my neighbors so that I have a a good view of my... We're missing the boat. Those are tremendous blessings, and there's nothing wrong in and of themselves. It's how we elevate them in our lives. And they take the place that is reserved for God and God alone. And so sometimes when that's happening in our lives, believe it or not, God brings difficulty. And sometimes it's suffering for our faith overtly, directly. Sometimes it's, it's experiencing his pruning because he knows my focus is wrong. Anybody, just pastors know about, I think we all face that. that there's times where... I need him to catch my attention so that my heart's open to respond and to confess and and turn and and come back to his loving arms. Not that I lost my my salvation. I just was not enjoying the intimacy of the fellowship that he says I can do. I can call him Abba, Father, Dad. And that's broken when I'm walking in independence and selfishness and focused here and now. And the beauty is... If we understand the big picture of Romans 8, as hard as suffering and difficulty is, we realize that God is using it for our good, which ultimately will bring him the greatest glory. And he can even use evil and sinful things and wicked people and all sorts of things to cause it to weave together for for our good. It doesn't say those things are good. In 828, it says he's causing them to work together for good. And in the, the, the plan of God to accomplish his purpose, he knows that that's the best way, that's his intended purpose to meet his culmination, his ultimate goal. And let me explain something. From a finite, limited perspective, which is not only your 
your pastor's dinky mind, but yours too, from finite and limited. It's, it's flawed. Sometimes I don't like that stuff. Sometimes I can't explain that stuff. Sometimes it doesn't make sense to me here and now. And that's what drives me back to the revelation of God's word, that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus and no separation from his love. And he's causing it all to work together. And he's God and I'm not. So the problem isn't with him. It's with me and my response to the stuff I'm experiencing. And... and, That's convicting, that's challenging, but don't miss the other part. That's encouraging, that's comforting. He'll never let it go. What he's doing is not random, it's not arbitrary, it's not to ruin your fun, it's to accomplish his end game, which he absolutely will bring to pass. And the reality is for believers, his children is going to include some suffering, some difficulties. But that is part of his plan to to refine us. And the confidence, the security we have, it can't separate me from his love. Wow. And so he says there in verse 18, I consider the sufferings of this present time. Don't even try to compare them with what God has in store compared to the glory that is to be revealed to us. And he, as we looked at just briefly an overview last week, the anxious longing of even the creation, God's created world, is in that place of stretching to see what does God have in store. That's his, he's given, it's kind of a form of personification, explaining that the, even the inanimate and animals that are animate, that God's creation, all of his creation, it's pictured as someone straining to see, wow, what does he have in store? And the beauty of that is Paul saying that creation is stressing, trying, straining to see what he has, the creation. It's waiting eagerly for something, the revealing of the sons of God. It's revealing for our redemption. It's waiting eagerly for Jesus to come back and to to take his kids home where he will transform, as we closed the message last week from Philippians, transform this vile body into conformity with his will. And he's going to do it by the power that he exerts even of himself. This This is what even creation is longing for that. And he tells us why. Verse 20, 20. For the creation was subject to fertility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, and in hope can either go at the end of that one or it can just continue, verse 21, in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to, slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. And we don't have time to look back at Genesis 1, 2, and 3. You can read that this week as well. If you've forgotten what happened in the beginning... That God created this world and it was perfect. Everything was good. Remember, after each day in the morning and the evening, it was good. The evening and the morning, it was good. It was good. It was good. And it was all good. The crowning culmination was to create humanity, Adam and Eve in his own image. Uh, the beauty, he, he took him from the dust of earth and Adam and he, he breathed into him the, the breath of life, the, the intimacy that Adam and Eve had with their God, their creator in this glorious garden. No sin, no evil, no wickedness, no death, no um, disease, no weeds, no thistles, no, it was glorious in the communication. And ultimately chapter three comes when, when Satan uses the, the, the serpent and, and deceive them and, and they choose to act independent of their God for the very first time, uh, they bought into his lie. They said, I'll do it my way. And they took of the fruit and, and sin entered the world and with it, Consequences. And if you read in Genesis 3, not only does God curse the the man and and the woman and and, and talk about things, he promises a future redeemer there right when it happens. Glory, Because this was his plan before he created them. 
This was all part of it, that, that even in their fall and their turning on their back, he would get the greatest glory by reaching out to redeem them, not based on their own merit. It would bring him ultimate glory. It, it's wonderful to see it that way. But what ends up happening is it's not just them that's cursed, but the creation. And, and most of the time we don't think about that. But Paul says here, it's yearning for, for the redemption of the sons of God when it will be released from the consequences of the fall. You continue reading through Old and New Testament, we understand that one day God's going to destroy this earth by fire and yet in Revelation, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth, he's going to build a brand new one. But the beauty is the creation is longing for it too because it's given it human-like feelings, personification, that it's yearning for that, longing for it. In verse 20, it says it didn't do this on its own. It wasn't subjected to this futility on its own. But because of him, God, who judged it. So that the creation itself, in verse 21, will be one day set free from its slavery. slavery. Boy, I've done that twice now. I don't think I'm having a stroke. But from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Keep going here. It gets even better. For we know that the whole creation groans. It's also going to say we groan. It's also going to say the Holy Spirit groans. This is, these are words that are, uh, uh, they want to sin. They can express the, 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 the suffering, the hardship is making them groan, want something, looking eagerly with expectation for it. The creation groans. It says, and we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pangs of childbirth together until now. And not only this, in verse 23, Paul says, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit who has indwelt us, and we've already received the blessings, all the, the ministry of the Holy Spirit, and that's the first fruit guaranteeing future harvest, resurrection, e eternal glorification. We've received the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves. Here it is again grown within ourselves waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons you say wait a minute mark i thought we were already adopted as sons verse 15 you've not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again but you've received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out abba father well we have We've already been redeemed when we trust Jesus as Savior and Lord. We've already experienced God's rescue, his redemption, his salvation. And that took place in, in, in the time continuum when you in the present temporal world responded to the good news of the gospel. But as we already said, it was already a part of God's heart and plan before he created the world in eternity past. It takes place in our time frame and it's not complete till we are ultimately glorified with him for all eternity and what Paul is saying here is that the suffering we experience on earth when we suffer that with him it's preparing us for an eternal weight of glory that we can't even grasp and understand God's definitely not wasting trials and tribulation and persecution and stress and, and, and confusion. He's using that to prepare us and equip us for what he ultimately has in store when we experience ultimate glorification. And that's why we said last week, we, it cannot not happen. Those whom he's called from before the foundation of the world are going to respond. When they respond, they ultimately will experience glorification as we are con confirmed to, conformed to the image of Christ and we share in his glory for all eternity. And the reality is if I don't focus on that in everyday life, there's a bunch of stuff to, to challenge me and get my focus skewed anybody relate to that when it's not fair when i don't like what's happening when i don't get the promotion that i i really deserved but i don't get it someone else does when i don't get accepted into that college when when really i i, I could have should have i should have but i didn't did 
He's not wasting. It's preparing us for, for, for glory is what Paul is saying here. And this glory is the ultimate culmination of our salvation. Salvation past, present, future. Guaranteed. Signed, sealed, and delivered by God himself. Folks, that should stir us. That should jack us up. That should excite us. That should change our focus. The things that I do here on earth should be viewed through the lens of heaven still coming. God's glory matters even now. I am so thankful for his loyal love and I'm growing in that love that I want to want what he wants so that my friends at school see a difference in my life. And it's not because I, as a guy, I wear my hair real short and I wear pants way up to here and I, I act like a nerd walking. I'm teasing. If you do, if that's your style, go with it. That's okay. But that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about a mindset either focused on me, myself, and I, and this world. And if I blend in like that and they see no difference, there probably won't be much persecution. But not only that, you're not getting equipped. You're not focused on what really matters. And it happens to me, it happens to you. And that's the beauty of what we see with our God causing it all to work together. Because at the end there of verse 23, it says, they're waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons. And this, I've written in my margin there, ultimate glorification. Yes, I'm saved. Yes, I'm absolutely secure. But it is still yet future for ultimate. If I were to die today, I would wake up, the real me would wake up in the arms of my Savior. Again, not because I earned it, not because I'm religious, not because I did a bunch of, it's because I responded to the good news of the gospel. By God's grace through faith, sins have been forgiven, I've been made brand new. So the real me, my spirit, my soul would wake up in the arms of my Savior for all eternity but I'd still be waiting for my glorified body fit for heaven, and that'll happen when Jesus comes back to get his kids. Um, and so if he comes back before I die or you die, what'd you say? Yeah. yeah. If he comes back, well, turn with me. I, I gave her bunches of verses, but I think that clock's running fast this morning. So we're going to close by just turning with me to 1 Corinthians 15. Um, you turn to 1 Corinthians 15. Um, Mindy, I'm going to have them turn to 15, but you just real quickly, the other passage I had them look at this week, on the screen put 2 Corinthians chapter 4. You don't turn there. You don't have, we don't have time. We've got to close here. You're in 1 Corinthians 15. In his next letter, Paul writes something about this, this whole idea of this temporal body looking for eternity if you remember he said it's the redemption of our bodies back in Romans chapter 8 there when the the humanness gets shed that that place where the enemy attacks me is no longer there I'm not only saved from sin's penalty it's power right now there's no excuse for me to keep sinning I still do, but I don't have a legitimate reason even here on earth. There's one day where I'm going to be saved from its very presence, right? And that's the redemption of the body when I'm home in heaven. And so in 2 Corinthians 4, you read it this week. I know all of you probably did, 4 and 5, because I asked you to. Never mind. 2 Corinthians 4, listen to verse 16 while you're in 1 Corinthians, and we'll close with that. Therefore, we don't lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, my humanness, my body. Oh, Michael doesn't feel like that. You're 18, 19, 20, 20. How old are you, buddy? 22. Sorry, man, I didn't get there. He doesn't feel the decaying of his body like I do. I'm 62. And jeepers is it happening quicker and quicker and quicker. But the whole idea is saying this body that was fit for, he for earth, not for heaven, is decaying. It's deteriorating. There's problems with, with my joints, with my thumbs, my hips, my eyes. I can't see. I got hearing. It's happening to me. And if it's not happened to you, it will. If Jesus doesn't come back, it's just, it's the outer body's decaying. But here's the beauty of what he says in 
in 2 Corinthians 4. Yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. The real me is I'm focusing on my Savior and the glorious redemption and his loyal love that will never let go and eternity and what really matters is I'm focused on that. He's renewing and refreshing us. He's refocusing us. It's happening day by day and look at what he says. Here's the context. For momentary light affliction. You say, but Mark, that's not what I'm experiencing. It's been years. That's not moments. It's heavy. It hurts. It's hard. And I'm not downplaying it. It's very real. There are times where I'll face it where you'll face it. But if we believe the truth of Romans chapter 8, it's not arbitrary. It's not random helter-skelter. God is using even that to make me more like Jesus and to prepare me. He's going to say something pretty cool here. To prepare me for glory. The more that I experience the hardship and the suffering and the, the difficulty here, the more prepared I am to experience his glory. He says the momentary light afflictions. It's producing for us an eternal weight of glory, a heavy mass of glory, far beyond all comparison. That's what he said back in chapter 8 of Romans. The sufferings we experience now, they're not even worthy to be compared with the glory that he has in store for us. He's saying he's using those things to equip us to experience his glory in a more intimate, real, genuine way. And this is temporal, even if it's been years. It's not eternity. You will not experience that in eternity. And folks, if you don't know Jesus as the Savior and Lord, you don't have that promise. Your suffering will go on and on and get even worse in eternal separation from him. Do you understand? It, you don't have the hope that he gives to us in Christ. That no matter what we experience here, it's light. It's momentary compared to eternity. It's a drop in the bucket. And and I struggle with that at times, even as a pastor, where my focus gets too much on me and, and what I think I need and what I deserve and what I should have. And when I'm focused that way, guess what? People don't see Christ in me, the hope of glory. He didn't leave. I'm just not walking close, and they're not seeing it. And, and I'm susceptible to, to sin and to the, the work of the, the world, the flesh, the devil. Focus, goals, priority, decisions based on eternity. If we see it light and momentary, as he says, it's producing eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are unseen. Anybody, don't raise your hand, I'm asking. You struggle with that at all this last week? To, to look at the things that I can see, that I can touch, that I can have, that I want, that should be mine, that I deserve, that are entitled. I do. He's saying, you're looking at the wrong stuff there. Your focus is on the wrong stuff. That's not eternal security, stability. He says, well, we look at the things which are seen not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal. They're passing. Even the suffering, the hardship, the difficulties, the confusion, the persecution for our faith, it's temporal. But the things that are not seen are eternal. And that's why he says in chapter 5, hey, these bodies are tents, temporary dwelling places. They're not fit for eternity. Praise God. Something better is coming. You know, he doesn't describe it in detail throughout the scriptures. We know parts of it. Uh, I have 1 John on there. We don't have time. I told you you're in 1 Corinthians 15. We'll look back at 1 John chapter 3 next week. Um, it's been written in my notes twice, but we'll get to it next week. And for what we're going to just jump to verse 50. 1 Corinthians 15, and I'm just going to read a few verses here that should excite all of us. And as I read them, I encourage us all, do some examining and evaluating of your own values, priorities, goals. I didn't say the people around you. I can't see your heart. And praise God, you can't see mine. 
it's not just the stuff we have, it's why we have them. Do you understand? It's motives, it's values, it's our attitudes towards things. So this examination is not to look around and say, wow, they're pretty stuck here on the earth. Look at all they have. Look at That's between them and God, but between each of us to evaluate our motives, our priorities, our values, our goals. Paul's laying out for us God's ultimate goal. Guess what? He's going to bring it to pass. No condemnation ends in no separation from his love. Ultimate glorification. But this should be convicting us to look at why I'm living and what really matters and why I get so mad at stuff that really doesn't why I'm withholding love and grace to be, be did anybody un, feeling a little more conviction than me? I'm sweating. I don't know if you are, but it's stuff to evaluate, to examine. Examine why am I here? What really matters? And this is what we look for. Verse 50 of 1 Corinthians 15. I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. He's already explained the differences behind different kinds of flesh. Um, that there's different kinds of bodies. One of them fit for heaven and one not. One for earth and one for heaven. He says, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit imperishable. But whatever. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep. We'll not all die here on earth. Um, Some will be taken out to be with God forever and ever, but we will all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. That should get a glory, a hallelujah, praise God. That's what is coming and, and it's all because of the gospel according to the first four verses of chapter 15 that Jesus died and rose again for our sins. He paid the way through faith in him. This is our guarantee. Jump to verse 54. When the perishable will have put on imperishable, the mortal will have put on immortality. Then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's ultimate glorification, friends. And you should be having some goosebumps about right now if you know Jesus as Savior and Lord. And that should be our focus so that the here and now matters. Do you understand? So that the here and now matters. Because that's what he says, therefore, verse 58, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Why? Knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. It gets better. And what he's using now, our focus should be eternity, which will change the way I see today, tomorrow, decisions, values, goals, priorities. And when they don't happen like I want, I will come back to Romans 8 and say, okay, I planned, I prepared, I worked hard, but the results are in your hands. Help me to understand why this is happening and give you glory all the same. Knock off the rough edges. Refine me. Use whatever you want to make me more like Jesus. Jesus so that my focus is on eternity and it'll change the way I live in the here and now and nothing gets better than that father change our hearts convict us and challenge us but bring us comfort as well the, these passages show us our security is in you it's not in our own strength and our and our own work and our own good things it, it's in your grace and your loyal love and and show us that we are absolutely secure in Christ. And for those that are struggling with that, Father, Holy Spirit, bring them closer to Jesus to know that if they've trusted him as Savior and Lord, eternity is theirs. And focus shouldn't be on me, myself, and I, but what you have in store. And so help us to see our security and our stability, our satisfaction is him. Christ in me, the hope of glory not just in 2023, but throughout our temporal time, passing through here on earth. Keep us focused on eternity. Thank you for ultimate glorification in Christ. Thank you for salvation, redemption, justification, 
all those things you do in us and through us and for us. But as we're reading, it's never because of us. It's because of you and your grace and your loyal love. We want to praise you for all eternity. We want to be used by you wherever you have us. Draw us closer to Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen.